believe it'll be remembered as one of the greatest blunders by the United States Postal Service. Recently, or actually a while back, they came up with a new stamp, a new Liberty stamp, and it had a picture of the Statue of Liberty on it. Have you seen it? Have you seen the stamp with the Statue of Liberty on it? Right. Well, it's really common. If, common if, you, if you buy a first-class stamp, in fact, that's probably the one you bought. But, but here's the problem. This problem really stems back to the fact that nobody was asking uh, all the right questions. Uh, when somebody said, hey, let's put the picture of the Statue of Liberty on the stamp, uh, I guess everybody assumed somebody would take a photo of the Statue of Liberty on Ellis Island. Show this, right? Like that, that's a fair, fair assumption. Like, hey, let's put a Statue of Liberty on a stamp. Let's go get a picture of this. Instead, they put a picture of the Statue of Liberty found on the Strip in Las Vegas. Wouldn't you love to have been a fly on the wall of that conversation? Like, can you just imagine the leadership of the USPS saying, hey, go get a picture of Statue of Liberty, and the photographer's like, oh, wait, I got a weekend trip to Vegas, I'll just pick it up there. Like, what do you, like, like how, how did this happen? Well, the statue, like, so this stamp has been in circulation for a long time, and the owner of this Statue of Liberty noticed that the stamp was this Lady Liberty and not Ellis Island. Lady Liberty. So the owner of this sued the USPS, and I think it came out last week that they won $3.5 million. $3.5 million. They were able to convince a jury that the Statue of Liberty in Vegas is more physically attractive than the Statue of Liberty on Ellis Island, thus selling more stamps. Anybody here, you have enough courage just to admit you bought more stamps than you needed because you thought Statue of Liberty was looking good? Any, no, okay, nobody. Well, they were able to convince a jury that that's exactly what happened. Isn't that absolutely ridiculous? But here's the thing. Here's the thing. Nobody asked, which Statue of Liberty is this? And the reality is many of us, we're not asking the right questions either. Sometimes there are questions, the right questions are so obvious, but we forget to ask it. There's a, a leadership guru, and he writes a good bit. His name is Danny N. And he says, when it comes to getting answers, the quality of your questions matter. Garbage in, garbage out. You don't get answers to questions you don't ask. And you get useless, even disastrous answers when you ask the wrong questions. Today, we're going to be looking at a passage of Scripture. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 22, verse 36, beginning in verse 36. Matthew 22, verse 36. This passage of Scripture that we're about to read, it should be a shock to the senses every time we read it. I believe every time we read this passage of Scripture, like it should shock us just a little bit. Uh, I would say that no other phrase uttered by Jesus should impact our thoughts and motivations like this one. And of all the passages of Scripture, none of Jesus' sayings should, should impact our motivations and the reasons we do things like this one. In fact, the Great Commission, we talked about that last Sunday, this idea to go out and make disciples and to teach others what Jesus has taught us. We even find its motivation in the passage we're about to read today. So Matthew 22, 22 beginning of verse 36. In fact, actually, I'm going to start in verse 34, though I believe for notes it only begins at 36. So beginning in verse 34. But when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees gathered together. And, and one of the Pharisees, a lawyer, asked Jesus a question to test Jesus. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great commandment. And first, commandment. And second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Now, if you're here today and you're not a Christ follower, I want to say thank you for being here. Uh, nobody's going to ask anything from you. We're just grateful that you're here. And if you're not a Christian, I do want to say one thing. As we read this passage, uh, there's probably something inside you right now agreeing. Like you're probably like, yep, there's something about that that is true. Now you may not be in full agreement when it says love God with all that you have, but something about that second part, to, to, love, up, to love your neighbor as yourself, there's something inside you right now saying, yep, that's true, that's accurate. There's something 
to this. I want to submit to you, the reason you're feeling that right now, the reason that's going off in your mind right now is because you were designed to feel that way. I submit to every single one of us, and I'd love to buy you a cup of coffee and share more of my perspective and hear your perspective, but I want to submit to you that you are not a cosmic accident. You're not a cosmic accident. You were designed on purpose, and you were designed to intuitively know that this is true. I'd even point back to Romans chapter 1 that says each one of us knows that there is a God up there. And each one of us, if you're feeling a tug, if you're not a Christian and you're feeling that tug, hey, there's something to this, man, I just want to ask you to listen. Like, listen to that. There's something tugging you in the right direction. Now, for the Christians in the room, let me tell you why this passage should be intriguing to you today. And in fact, there's a lot of reasons. There's a lot of reasons, right? This may be one of the most pivotal passages of Scripture, but there's one reason why this, this passage of Scripture should be intriguing to you today that I want to point out. I believe many of us are just like the Pharisee that asked the wrong question. I believe many of us approach Jesus and we say, teacher, teacher, which is the greatest commandment? Here's the problem with that. Jesus is teacher, but he's so much more than that. He's so much more than that. To call him teacher is the problem of what he really is, Lord, Savior, God. And I would submit to you that many of us are asking the same wrong question. We come to Jesus and we say, teacher, what, what, is, what is your input on this? Many of us don't ask the right questions of Jesus because we think of him as Lord, right? Like in our mind, we think of him as our Lord, but the way that we act really acts as if he's just our teacher. Hey, Jesus, I'm not asking you to make a decision on this. Jesus, I just want your input on this. And because of that, we're asking the wrong questions. We ask questions to solve secondary problems, and remarkably, we're silent in asking the most fundamental questions of our faith. In fact, if you're like me, I hear the questions that race through my mind. And I've got to admit, I'm a little bit embarrassed to, 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 to reveal this to you. I mean, just kind of pull back the curtain on how I think and what goes through my mind. And I'm embarrassed because I'm a Christ follower. I've committed to, to love God and love others with all that I have. But, but still, uh, these are the thoughts that go through my mind. Uh, let me tell you this. Uh, the thoughts that plague my mind, that saturate my mind during the day are things such as, hey, how can one day I retire comfortably? The kind of questions that race through my mind is, hey, how can I have a better vacation next year than I did this year? Uh, how can I ensure that my kids are the absolute best and fill in the blank? How can I do things to relieve and alleviate the stress and the pain in my life? And the kind of questions that just, they're just so, they're so, they're so constant in my mind are all me-centric questions. My guess is I'm not alone on this. My guess is I'm not alone on this. So many of us, man, we seek to do the right thing, but we're, we're constantly thinking about us. So what's the solution? The solution I've been working on is that we must start asking better questions. We've got to train our mind to start asking the better questions. Now, don't get me wrong. There's a place for all of those questions I just mentioned. There's a place for that. But what does it mean when those are the predominant questions in our life? I would submit to you that the better question is how can we love? Is how can we love? If you go back to the beginning of our passage, there's a religious lawyer and he's asking Jesus, what is the most important commandment? And the religious lawyer was expecting Jesus to say several things, but he was not expecting Jesus to say what he said. In fact, um, have you ever known a culture, have you ever known a political cultural culture where the liberals wanted to give special focus to the down and out, and the conservatives wanted special focus on safety and protection. Uh, anybody ever, 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 ever know, ever, ever heard of a culture like that before? Um, of course, I'm, I'm talking about the political atmosphere of Jesus' day, okay? I'm talking about the political culture of Jesus' day. Do you see what I just did there, okay? All right, yeah, every society wrestles with this. And so did they at Jesus' day. Check this out. Check this out. Uh, let me, let me, I got to get this just right. The Sadducees, they were the liberals, the political, religious liberals in Jesus' day. The Sadducees looked at the Bible and said, look, the most important thing is to help the poor and the down and out, to help the refugees and those suffering. 
the, the, the Pharisees, the conservatives, the religious conservatives looked at the Bible and said, look, the most important thing is to respect your parents, to love justice, and to keep the numerous laws which are the fabric of our faith and society. And the scene in which we're reading this morning, one of the liberals, a, a Sadducee, asked a question about the afterlife. And it was in disregard to what the Bible actually teaches us. And it says that Jesus answered him in such a profound way that it completely silenced the Sadducees. Like the Sadducees said, okay, we rest our case. We're not going to ask any more questions about that. And so you could just imagine like the group of the conservatives, the Pharisees, they saw this and they said, wow, maybe Jesus isn't one of them. Maybe Jesus is one of us. Let's go ask him a question. So, so this religious, a conservative uh, lawyer, a Pharisee, approached Jesus to prove a point to the liberals. And Jesus answered in such a profound way that it silenced the lawyer. You ever, found a, you ever seen a lawyer lost for words before? Yeah, me neither. But Jesus somehow did it. Each one of them, the, the conservatives and the, and the liberals, uh, the religious, uh, in the religious, religious sense in Jesus' day, they were both expecting Jesus to say something different, but Jesus said something else. Jesus silenced the lawyer by saying, listen, it's not, it's not, it's not hey, just love people at the expense of loving God. It's not uh, love God at the expense of loving other people. It's a both and. It's a both and. And I caution myself and anybody else here today who acts like a Sadducee or a Pharisee, and it is not the Jesus position. It's not the Jesus position. The Jesus position is to love God and to love others at all costs. The Jesus position is to love and obey God and to love and serve the down and out. The Jesus position is to ask less questions about how to live a self-centered life and more questions on how to live a God and other-centered life. The, the, the question is not what the Pharisee asked. The question is not, uh, a teacher, give me some input on my life. The better question is to approach Jesus and, my, and say, my God, how do I love you better? My God, how do I love my fellow man? That is the better question. When the conservatives and when the liberals approached Jesus, they expected all sorts of answers. They did not expect Jesus to say what he would say. And many of us, too, some have expected to say, hey, love others at the cost of loving God or, 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 or love God at the cost of loving others. Jesus said neither. In fact, Jesus said we were to do both simultaneously. In fact, what we just referred to is this love God with all that we have and love our neighbors ourselves. It's actually referred to as the Christian's great commandment. We are called to do both at the same time. Many thought that it was either one or the other, but Jesus said no. It's possible to do both. And he showed us how to do it. Some wanted Jesus to lean one way. Some wanted Jesus to lean the other way. And we're the same way. We are all asking Jesus the wrong questions most of the time. Even when we're spending intentional time with God and we find ourselves asking the wrong questions. When we wake up early and we, we, we go to God in prayer and opening up his word, and many times we find ourselves asking the wrong question. We're not asking, God, how do I love you more? How do I love my neighbor as myself? And if I could just kind of continue the time of confession up here, if I could just kind of tell a little bit more of just my secret thoughts and what goes on up here. Uh, many times in the morning, most mornings, I will wake up super early to spend dedicated time with no distractions with Jesus in prayer and the scripture. And even as I'm opening up this Bible on my front porch and I'm turning to the passage of scripture I'm about to read, as I'm reading the scripture, my mind is filled with thoughts and questions. My mind is constantly thinking, okay, what else do I need to do the rest of the day? Uh, what, how, how much money do I have in the bank account right now? Hey, let me pull up the Redstone app and check real quick. And even as I'm reading the scripture, my, my, my mind starts asking a question, am I saving enough for retirement? How many more years can I get out of my Corolla before I need to replace it? Even as I'm praying, I start thinking to myself, how in the world am I gonna help my three daughters go to college? How in the world am I going to pay for three weddings? I actually figured that one out. I'm going to marry them myself in the backyard. So check. Next question. All right. Right? And we start, we start thinking of all these things. Right? Even as I find myself reading the scripture, my mind is saturated 
with the wrong questions. Man, how am I going to write another book? How can I alleviate that stress? How am I going to respond to that person who offended me? We're asking the wrong questions. And sometimes some of you will come to me and they say, say, Tim, every time I sit down to pray and to read the scripture, my mind just goes in all these different directions. How do I stop that? And I've got no idea. When you figure it out, let me know. The reality is, God told us something very clear to do, to love God and to love others. And yet we fail at this all the time. But praise God, Jesus Christ did it. I don't think there's any other passage of Scripture that more clearly shows us that Jesus is our only hope than this one. I believe it's this passage of Scripture where, where our instructions are so clear and yet we see how far from the goal we are. And it just makes me realize there is absolutely nothing I could do to save myself. There's just absolutely nothing I, there's nothing I could do. God says, love me. But I didn't. But thank God Jesus Christ did. That's one of the joys of having a roommate that's a printing company. God says love others. But I didn't. Not most of the time. But praise God, Jesus always loved others. And when we start seeing this, we start seeing this like, wait, wait, God told me to love God and love others and so frequently I don't. And we begin to realize just how important it is what Jesus Christ did on that cross for each one of us who've placed our faith in him. This morning, I submit to you, we do not set out to begin asking the right questions, hoping that we will earn God's love for us. Rather, we seek, we are compelled to ask the right questions because God is so madly in love with us already. Until we understand that, we don't understand the gospel. Listen, we, there's nothing we can do to save ourselves. And we place our faith in Jesus Christ. And when God looks at us, he no longer sees our filthiness, but he sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ standing in our place. And last week, I shared one of the best love stories I've ever personally been part of. Essential Church was given a totally paid-for church building for absolutely free. If you're, if you're fairly new here, if you were not here last week, that's the information I shared, uh, that, that we have been given a paid-for church building. This is the result because the people of Five Points Baptist Church, they loved God and they loved others enough to choose a course that went against their preferences. At one point, they were asking, you know, uh, them related, right, self-centered questions, right? Like, how do, we, how do we do this? How do we do this thing? And at some point, it switched. Hey, what is the most loving thing we can do with this building? And everybody at Essential says, praise God, thank you for asking that right question. Five Points Baptist Church, they put their mission over the preference, over their preference. Here at Essential Church, we must always put mission over our personal preferences. Every single one of us, those who follow Christ here at Essential Church, we will not begin any conversation with what is best for us. We must Ask, we must begin every conversation by asking the right question. What is best for loving God and for loving others as ourselves? Last week I shared the biggest news that, that I've probably have ever been part of as a church. We have been loved well. We were given a church building a mile from here in historic five points for free. And now we do have a part to play. Every single one of us who are part of this church, if, we, if this is where we are, this is our home, like, man, we've got a part to play in this. Now is the time for us to begin asking the right questions. We need to be asking the right questions. Let me give you a few examples. The wrong question is how can we get away easy? How can we give away easy? Uh, okay, our church has been given this. How can I do just enough so that nobody is suspicious of me? Right? That's the wrong question, right? Like, how can I serve just enough that nobody thinks of it? Or how can I give just enough that hey, nobody, nobody calls me? 
I mean, listen, we're not going to be hunting anybody down. Don't worry. And the fact, man, it's, just so you know, like, hey, man, my, my mind is where these questions come from. You know what I'm saying? And many times when we're given an opportunity to love God and to love others, we start by asking, okay, what's the least, what's the minimum that I can do here? That's the wrong question. And the wrong question on the opposite side is, hey, how can I give so much that I will be praised? Man, as we're asking God, God, what do you want us to do? What, like, like, what do you want my part to be in this new building? God may place it on your heart to give generously and sacrificially. In fact, I believe that will be true uh, for those of us who call this home. I've already heard stories from many of you where God has placed on your heart to give a sacrificial gift. Whatever God tells you to do, say yes to. But we've got to be careful when inside of us we start thinking, oh, wow, look how good I am. Look how good I am. We've got to be careful. The wrong question would be, how can I give a compulsive gift? And the wrong, you know, like, it's like, hey, that first number that pops in your head, like, no, like, like, listen, you need to take this back, you need to talk to who you need to talk to, you need to pray about this. Don't be compulsive either. The right question is, how can I love God and love, love others with this gospel opportunity that I've been invited into? That is the right question. Two really important dates. First, if you've not seen the new building, I want to invite you to come see it tomorrow night at 6.30 p.m. We're going to meet right here in this building, 6.30 p.m. If, if this is part of your church or you're fairly new, come and join me tomorrow night, 6.30 p.m. We meet right here. I'll share a few details. Then we'll go get in our car and we'll drive a mile over there to Five Points and we'll check out the new space. I want, uh, please, I want you to come see this. It's awesome. If you've already seen it, you don't need to go on a tour again, though I will say you're welcome to come and join if you want to see some of the progress. We had a mission team that, uh, from another church here in town, Mount Zion, that's, that's been working over there last week, and it had been incredible progress. I'd love for you to come see that. If you'd like to be part of that, come meet me right here at 6.30 tomorrow night. Uh, there will be child care available here. We'll have child care. But let me say this. We've got two or three people um, uh, signed up to help with that, with child care. So what I'm really trying to say here is if you have another child care option, take that other option. If you do not have a babysitter available, uh, man, bring them here. We're going to have amazing child care here, 6.30 tomorrow night. The other date is this coming Saturday. Coming Saturday, this coming Saturday, uh, 7.30 a.m., we're going to have our first work day as a church. The first work day as a church, it's good. It's, A, it's going to be a lot of fun, and I think we're all going to really enjoy our time together. And two, we're going to be able to do something really, really valuable and really, really helpful. We're going to come together as a church, and we're going to start working on that. We're going to be at 730. We'll meet at the new building. Uh, just keep your ears open this week. Be sure you check the newsletter and our social media. We'll have really clear instructions on, on, on when and where if, you, if you're not following this. But 730 there. And no matter what your level of physical, um, I don't know the right word is, but whatever you can do physically, we want you involved. Uh, if you're not able to uh, uh, pick up and carry large, you know, anything, that's fine. Come and be part of it. If the only thing you do is gather and pray, that'd be enough. If the only thing is that you come over there and you help pass out cold bottles of water, that'd be enough. But if this is your church, I want, you to, I want you to be involved in some way. If you can't, if there's just absolutely no way you can do it this Saturday, there's going to be other, other opportunities. But I want us to be asking the right question. This opportunity, this gospel opportunity that I'm being invited into What's the most loving thing that I can do? I want to kind of want to wrap it up with one more passage of scripture. This one is actually just a couple chapters of the one, after the one that we just read. This is Matthew chapter 25, uh, beginning in verse 31. Jesus just told us that we are to love God with all that we have, and the second is like it, to love our neighbors ourselves. And for some of us, man, we, we may have a hard time. We say, okay, Tim, I want to ask the right questions, but what does, what does this look like? I believe Jesus answers this. He says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, that's Jesus, when Jesus comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then Jesus will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and Jesus will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king... This is Jesus will say to those on his right, come, you 
who are blessed by my Father inherit the kingdom prepared for you. And from the foundation of the world, uh, for those of us who follow Jesus Christ, that will be the most glorious day. For I was hungry, this is Jesus speaking, for I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And you got to think, like all those who follow Jesus will say, wait, we didn't do any of those things. Jesus, you were, what are you talking about? You weren't in jail? We didn't do any of those things. In verse 37, the righteous will answer Jesus saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? If anything, their minds were going back to when Jesus fed them. And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? Jesus, we never saw any of that. And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king, Jesus, will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. My friends, you are being invited into an opportunity to do something for Jesus Christ. If this next thing, if it's foreign to you, I want to ask you to pick up a couple things before you leave today. All the details of what's going on in the church with the next, moving into the new building, it's in this brochure. They're at both entrances. Be sure you pick one up if you need one. Also part is a, is a commitment card. I want you to be praying about what is God placing it on your heart to do. And on August 12th, we're going to have a commitment day and we'll bring forward our gift. gifts. What I'm asking you to do is be asking the right question. What is the most loving thing you can do in this opportunity? We are doing this for God's glory. This week, I want to encourage you, begin asking the right questions. We need to take a, a few steps away from me-centric questions and a few steps towards God and other centric questions. Let's pray. God, we're grateful for the way you love us. Jesus, thank you for doing what we were unable to do on our own. Jesus, you came. You lived the life that was expected of each one of us, but we didn't do that. Jesus, you did. And Jesus, you paid the penalty for our sin. You paid our debt in full on that cross. We thank you that you died the death each one of us deserved, but you didn't stop there. Jesus, you gave us the reward you alone could earn. And we praise you and we worship you and we thank you. What a glorious day it will be when Jesus, when you return and you say, enter. God, we praise you, we worship you, thank you for what you're doing in this church. It is not a result of our good works, it is a result of your grace and your blessing and your favor. And on behalf of all those who call us central home, we say thank you. God, help us to stay honest in asking the right questions. My God, how can we love you all the way out? My God, how can we love our neighbors ourselves?